This is 21st Century Reformation at 21stcr.org. Sometimes we know what we believe. We don't always know why we believe it as well as we should. If we never explore why we believe something or broaden our understanding of it, then we might be faulty. And how do we know that we're not mistaken? But when it comes to one God issues, there are some really, really good reasons why that we believe what we believe. But sometimes we need to reinforce ourselves, so to speak, or take another look and understand a little bit why we believe what we do. And, uh, but there are two passages of Scripture, two Scriptures in the Bible, and uh, they're just almost unknown Scriptures to our Christian friends in general. The first one I want to talk about is Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter, and verse four. And uh, this is one of the two great verses of the Bible that uh, we want to think of. But, uh, so Deuteronomy six and four, who's speaking here? Who knows? Moses, thank you. And uh, this is uh, Moses speaking to, this isn't too hard, Right? Israel. Okay, the nation of Israel. Way back in, uh, in their infancy, as it were, as a nation. And uh, Moses is giving the, the law, as it were, the law of Moses. <laughs> he's giving the law of Moses to the, uh, the children of Israel. So he's rehearsing all these things before them. But what we do get in Deuteronomy and the sixth chapter is Moses talking to the people and conveying to them what's important. And so uh, Moses comes along and his words in English are, Hear, O Israel. That doesn't quite catch the significance of it. In the Hebrew language, you get the, the oomph that goes into this. Okay, It's actually more like uh, something like this. Hear, listen, pay attention, Israel. So, Moses is saying a whole bunch of stuff here, but when he gets to these words, it's like in case anybody's mind has wandered, they're thinking about how it used to be over in Egypt or something, we don't know. We, he, he's going to get their attention back. Hear, O Israel. I can, not Moses, but I, I can give you the, the idea. <laughs> Hear, listen, pay attention to this. So, he's been talking along, and he's going to talk some more, but pay attention now. So, this, uh, this word here that leads off on this, this thing that he's going to give them actually uh, is in, in Hebrew has turned out to be the word here is Shema. Shema! Pay attention, listen. Okay. That has, this statement that he's about to make to them is so important that it's been given the name by, by rabbis and, and others. It's been given the name just called the Shema, the listen up statement, <laughs> the pay attention statement. Okay. Well, it's interesting. <clears throat> Unless you're doing an awful lot of Bible reading, I may already, and now you here, this is different because you're informed. Uh, we, we don't have low-grade information Christians here. We're, we're trying to be, you know, in, in good shape uh, in our understanding of things. But, but if not, the, for the typical Christian, I've already said things probably we don't know as Christians, but should we? We've got something here that's so important that it starts out with the words, Shema, listen. Okay, very critical, very important. And uh, so it seems to me that we would want to know about this, this business, this Shema. What's that about? Actually, he doesn't even say this, this, this powerful statement. He doesn't say these powerful words when he gives the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments, he gives the Ten Commandments. But when he gets to this, he wants everybody's attention. So from the thousands of Israel, he's saying, listen, pay attention, get this. And it's kind of like with this sense. If you don't get anything else, get this. Ha! Okay. So, 
in, in English, it usually translates as about six words, but in, he, in Hebrew, it's actually only four very important words, and I think it will help us to get it in both sense. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, okay, ha, you not low information Christians, what, what does the word Lord mean when you see it in this configuration? God. Yeah, that's right. God, which, which literally, actually, Yahweh, which is, or Yahweh, some think, it's, we don't know exactly how it was pronounced, but we do know it's there. Yahweh, okay, so the Lord, Yahweh, our God, is one Lord, or one Yahweh. There's not two or three of him. There's no multiples of him. It's just one, one fellow. That's it. So, in, in Hebrew, in, it is Shema Israel. That's the first two. The rest of this, then, is just this. Yahweh, our Elohim, Eloheinu. Yahweh, Eloheinu, is one Yahweh. Okay. What it seems that this means to uh, Jewish people, even to this day, because they're not ignorant about this, Unfortunately, our Christian community often is. But to the Jewish person to this day, they're very keen about this. And this means there is no divisibility within Yahweh. There's not two or three Yahwehs. There's not two or three anythings. It's one. So here we are. Hear, O Israel. Shema Israel. Yahweh Elohenu. Yahweh Ikad. Okay, so that Ikad is one, okay, one and only one, indivisibly one. What do you think? Now, I said that this is important because uh, Moses announces it with this listen up language. This has become so important, became so important to the, uh, the Jewish folks uh, of that day and on, that they all know it. <clears throat> In fact, can we go just a little further? Verse 5, please. And thou shalt love Yahweh, your God, your, your Elohim, with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Verse 6, and these words which I command you this day. Listen to this now. <clears throat> now he's focusing them. What I'm commanding you today, you love him. Notice, not them. You love him. When it comes to the business of God, there's only one who is, and you love him. And he says here, these things will be in your heart, verse 7, and you shall teach them diligently to your children. Now, I don't know about you, most of us as Christians growing up, we don't think about teaching these words to our children. But they did, and they do. So you're going to teach them diligently to your children, and you will talk of them when you sit down in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. <clears throat> what are you, the things that I'm telling you here, right now, this day, you, you teach those to your children. And you talk about these words. When, you're, when you go to bed, when you rise up, when you're, when you're eating, be talking about them. He, now, he's not talking about just going around and, and making some kind of a you know, ritualistic thing out of them. He means talk about them. Hey, isn't it great? We know the Lord. We know that he's God. We know there's no one else. We know that he's indivisible. He's one. There's not multiples of him. We know there's not two or three Yahwehs. We know that our God is God and that's it. Isn't that interesting? He wants them talking about that. So this is very interesting then. When you rise up. Well, here's the good part about it is they did it. They did do it. So much so that how many of you have heard this strange in the King James' phylacteries, and I think you'll find it elsewhere. But in the New Testament, it talks about phylacteries. Strange word. Isn't it? But phylacteries, <laughs> phylacteries were little boxes that uh, uh, Jewish folks 
believed and thought that they should actually uh, write these words, the, the words of Deuteronomy 6 and 4 and a few other key things, but write them down, put them in these boxes, and then because this is supposed to be in your mind and in your heart, they would, uh, they would put the phylactery, sort of bind it to their forehead, and then they would put uh, a phylactery maybe on their right, left arm, perhaps, or near their heart, whatever. And so the words of Deuteronomy, you don't have to get them out and read them. It's just like saying, guess what's up here on my forehead? You know? <laughs> Deuteronomy 6 and 4 is there, maybe a couple other things. And what's on, what's on this? Because I'm binding them. Uh, on my heart. I'm putting them in my, my mind. And so this is an outward symbol. What Jesus is doing, actually, he never says they shouldn't do that. But uh, the, what he says is that uh, the, the, the hypocrites that uh, Pastor Mark was talking about so, so well last week tend to want to make broad their phylacteries. What he means is make super phylacteries, really big ones. <laughs> we don't want anybody to miss this phylactery business, do we? I'm wearing a phylactery on my forehead up here. Uh, you know, it's as big as, a, as an army chest or something. But, uh, the, uh, but I'm trying to make a point about me in that case. So very interesting. But this one statement, Deuteronomy 6 and 4, the Shema, is probably uh, the single most important statement in all the Jewish religion. We think about the Ten Commandments, which is very important uh, to the uh, Jewish folks. This one's more important. <clears throat> and this is the statement that there have been rabbis, notable great rabbis in history that in their dying moments, this is what they recited. This is what they, they said. Now it's interesting too, we might uh, notice this, uh, in, if we're not already aware, that this statement is held to by the Jewish nation. They never quit. You know, they never quit. And back then when the post-biblical, everybody know what post-biblical means? After, post, after, after the Bible. Okay. When the post-biblical ideas got going, <clears throat> that God was multiple fellows. There's two or three fellows who composed God. When that got going in post-biblical times, because the Bible actually never really says that, then there was this struggle then in post-biblical times, in the second, third, particularly the fourth, fifth, sixth, and on through the, uh, through the ages there. Uh, but there was a struggle then between the Jewish folks and the new Christians who, and I mean the new new Christians, who came to the conclusion, well, God probably is two or three guys, not just one. This was the key verse that held the Jewish folks in their, in their hearts and their minds so that they were always unswerving. And so they would never embrace the Trinity. Isn't that interesting? Even to this day, this continues to be pretty much the case. <clears throat> we have uh, 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 some, uh, but really not a lot, of Messianic Jews. God bless them. Uh, who are, have crossed over and trying to, and have, I suppose, embracing Jesus as the Christ, as the Messiah. And uh, so for them, there is a, a unique struggle for them. This whole thing of the Shema, which they've known from the time they were this little as, as Jewish folks, is at odds in their minds with the problem of the, uh, the multi-person God. So there's a struggle for the Jewish folk. I, I'm just, these things are all true. You can check them out for yourself. So, um, so the, the result of this struggle has been that not very many Jewish people have received uh, this view of Jesus as the Christ over the centuries. In fact, I hate to say this, and this is a terrible blight on Christianity, that Christians through the Dark Ages, post-biblical times again, were very much, uh, uh, so much at odds against the, uh, the Jewish folks for not embracing the idea of a multi-person God that they actually uh, did very un ungood, unhappy things toward the, the Jewish folks that would not embrace Christianity. 
So, but, uh, but you could sum it all up in word. Right here it is. This is where that the Jews were from Moses on. Okay, as long as they were right before God, they knew that there was none other but this one who is Yahweh, he and him alone. And this is very important to them. And they held through it all down through New Testament times, on into post-biblical times, and then on up to this day. Up to this day. So it's very interesting. Uh, Sharon and I uh, uh, were privileged to be invited to visit a synagogue. This has been a few years ago. By some really nice folks. Never been in a synagogue before. Thought it would be interesting and educational. So we went. And uh, very nice folks. Great thing. But I was just uh, astonished when I realized they would be standing. They, they, they do this thing. You'd find it fascinating. But they do this thing where they stand up and recite scripture. Okay. But I still remember the little kids. They're having all the little kids. And all the little kids are standing up. And what are they saying? It just amazed me. They're standing up saying, Shema Israel. Yahweh Eloheinu. Yahweh Echad. Wow. Little kids. Do you get a sense of this difference, huh? Okay. Well, this statement has been kind of disregarded. Now, if you want to, you know, get into the, the, the uh, theologians and the people who do all this severe theolog theological work, then, of course, their Christian theologians are going to know about this. But it's tended to be dismissed and unknown in Christian congregations. You think about it. When's the last time you heard anybody reciting the Shema in our Christian congregations? It doesn't come. When did you last see it on a wall? Well, Jewish folks are wearing it on their bodies. <laughs> see the difference in this, this way of thinking. Very important. Okay. So, the, uh, we even had uh, some uh, uh, Christian scholars coming along and saying, well, that's not a particularly Christian concept. Well, that's kind of scary, I guess. That, well, the question would be, well, why not? Okay, that's more a Jewish concept and not a particularly Christian concept. That's, that's a semi-quote pretty close to it from uh, what some have said. So here we are, Shema. We find this in the Hebrew Bible, which we call what? The Old Testament, okay? So if you hear somebody talk about the Hebrew Bible, that's not anything strange. It's just what the Jews call the Old Testament. They wouldn't want to call it the Old Testament because they don't have a New Testament. <laughs> so, so they're going to call it the Hebrew Bible, okay? Meaning they're, they're talking about the fact that it was in Hebrew, written originally in Hebrew. So they may be carrying around in English translations, but they call it the Hebrew Bible, okay? So here we are in the Old Testament then, our, the Christian Old Testament. And uh, here we are, everything is kind of focused around or focused on the Shema. Okay. Now we mentioned that there is this New Testament period, and then out here, PB. You know about BC and, and AD, and now this is, this is PB, post biblical, okay? Meaning after the Bible, after the time, Bible times, things went on. I really think that it's out here we got into a lot of problems as Christianity. Okay. Things got kind of strange in uh, these post-biblical times. But as the decades went on and then eventually turned into centuries, Christians, I think, we got lost in our own woods. Uh, we we kind of just got so lost in being ourselves and who and what we were. And we still want to refer back to the Bible and all, but back actually we got into our own post-biblical Christian world, thinking, way of thinking. But here is a great test for us, I think, and this is why this is one of the two most important verses. Okay, okay. One of the two most important uh, that we can think about, and this is so little known by our fellow Christians, but should be keenly known by us, and that is, what about this middle period then that we're talking about? This, what about the New Testament period? 
which, what was the leaning there? Were they really thinking like the post-biblical guys that there are two or three Yahwehs? This guy's Yahweh. And so you've got these, these ideas going on. So we have the idea of the Father is Yahweh, Jesus is Yahweh. Doesn't that sound a little confusing right there? And, and it is. And then we have the Holy Spirit, which is really just God himself, the Father in motion. But we say, oh yeah, and that's a Yahweh. Well, doesn't that sound like three Yahwehs to you? Wouldn't that create a little bit of a question or a problem for us? I think so. Especially when the statement itself is saying, Yahweh, Ikad, there's just one who is Yahweh. Don't, don't give me another guy that you say is also Yahweh. No, no, our, our Lord, our God, he's just one. There's nobody else that is him but him. Okay. If, if God's son is also God, then that means he's Yahweh too, right? Yeah. Well, doesn't that create a problem? I think it does. And don't misunderstand me, I'm not casting aspersions at anyone because I spent a good deal of my life thinking that very way. This very scripture and the things we're talking about right now is part of what helped me to kind of walk out of that and realize, oh my goodness, uh, as Christianity, we've been way too uh, 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 leaning into our own developed post-biblical traditions and not enough into the solid scriptural position. Okay. So how does this work then when it comes to Jesus and his disciples? Did they look at the Shema and say, well, that's not really particularly Christian? <laughs> you know, or did they look at it and say, oh, we don't really need that? Or that, forget all that. There's two or three of us who are Yahweh now, right? Or two, you know, did, would that be Jesus' view? We can solve this question, interestingly enough, because I think the wisdom of God gave us this understanding. So if we can go to then to uh, Mark, the 12th chapter. And uh, this is going to be Jesus speaking. Let's go to verse 28 or so. Thank you. Yeah, this catches it right. Guess what Jesus is going to talk about. Don't, don't say it. Don't say it out loud. Okay. <laughs> Jesus is speaking, and various ones have been posing questions to him. Okay. Listen to what happens on this particular occasion where someone's going to pose a question to him. And one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, so we got, he's already been talking to some guys, and another scribe comes up, uh, and Hearing them reasoning, he's kind of listening. And he says, and perceiving that he had answered them well, meaning he really, hey, Jesus really answered those guys very well. He was very taken with that. So he asked him, I'll, I'll ask him a question too then. See how I can do with this. And he's, he asked him, which is the first commandment of all? And so what he's posing to Jesus is, the law has... 600 and something different laws, commandments. I mean, the law is made up of laws, multiple, you know, bunches of them. And so he's saying, which of the 600 and something, whatever, which is the most important? When, he, when he's saying here first, we're using the word first, not like which one was written down first, but which is first in terms of priorities? Which is first in terms of greatness or significance? And uh, so, so he said, which is, the, which is the first, the greatest of all the commandments? Okay, let's look at verse 29 then. This is another verse that your Christian friends read every time they read their New Testaments. Okay, verse 29. Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, isn't this interesting? Because I would assume that now he's going to tell them I have to be honest, if I'd been there, I would have just assumed he's going to say, the first of all the commandments is the first of the Ten Commandments. Wouldn't that make sense? You should have no other gods before, you know, before our God. No, this one's better than that. Listen to this. He answered, he said, the first of all the commandments is, ah, oh, there it is, the Shema. Hear, O Israel. 
The Lord our God is one Lord. And in the New Testament, because of the shift in languages, you don't get the capitals O, R, and D, but you know from the Old Testament reading the same verse that it is capitals O, R, and D. So we are talking about Yahweh, right? We're talking about, we're talking about God. So here it is. Now it's actually in Greek in our New Testaments. So listen, Israel. Pay attention, Israel. This is the greatest of all the commandments. And uh, the Lord our God is one Lord. Okay. I really like a translation. And uh, I think my translation of the, of the statement, in the, particularly out of the Hebrew, is, is more like this. Listen, Israel. Hear, Israel. The Lord is our God. Okay, it's an inferred verb of being. The Lord is our God. The Lord alone. That's very good, actually. And the, the JPS, the uh, Jewish Publication Society Bible now, has adopted that, recognizing that that's probably the better, even the better sense of it. The Lord is our God. The Lord alone. Nobody else. Just Him. So uh, this is very interesting. So here we are. Does that strike you as possibly of importance to us as Christians? I mean, to be a Christian means certain things, critically, I think, doesn't it? I think we've missed it a lot, and I think God's very kind to us and patient with us as, as people. And we are trying many times and very sincere in what we're doing, but that still doesn't dismiss the fact we're often missing it. And this is a case where I think we have. But I think that when Jesus is saying, this is the first of all the commandments, bar none, I would think that that then would be something we would want to pay attention to. Listen, what do you think? Yeah. So the Shema in the New Testament becomes a, a kue, okay, in, in Greek, but it's just translated, so it's fine. So what do you think? <laughs> Who's right about this? I think that Jesus has spoken. And when I began to look at this matter, coming from a different perspective on an all misunderstanding of it, it really was, but when I began to look at this matter and let Jesus be the arbiter, let Jesus be the decider, the one who determines, who decides what's, this, what's important, what's it all about. Not only what is it, what's the first commandment, and, and the fact that it is the first commandment, the most important of them all. Wow! And, uh, and so now we have Christians way out here in PB days, and you know, you can, you can sometimes you read, I've read the Christian scholars saying, well, you know, all that Shema business is not very Christian and not of particular interest to us Christians. Why? What are you talking about? Ha! You know, why shouldn't we? Why shouldn't we? When they were going to teach their children this, when they woke up in the mornings and over, the, over, the, over coffee, I guess they had coffee, did they? Anyway, but over whatever they drank for, uh, to get going in the mornings, right? <laughs> To Jesus. <laughs> well, that's exactly right. They're still talking about it, isn't he? We must not be a very Christian. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know why he wanted to talk about that. That's not a very Christian thing. <laughs> but that's kind of revealing, isn't it? If we say as Christians, PB Christians, we're saying, well, that's not a very Christian thing. Well, who changed? Who moved, so to speak? You see what I'm saying? Why, why is it not a very Christian thing? What are you talking about here? Uh, I thought we were here to follow Jesus. You know, isn't being Christian about that I am his follower? That what's important to him is important to me? That what he says, I put credence in that? Isn't that significant? Wow. I, I would think so. And, uh, and actually, actually, fundamentally, I think the most central issue about being a Christian is that my God, as a Christian, is the same God that Jesus worshipped. I worship the same one he worshipped. I serve the same God he served. Now I am a Christian. And when we begin to, you know, bright people, brilliant men in many cases, women, <clears throat> but out here saying, 
You know, that's not all very Christian, is it? I don't see what that has much to do with us. Let's just keep trucking. Well, isn't it interesting that the same people who will say that, you can see them out there hammering away, posting up on their, their church walls the Ten Commandments. Try them out sometimes. I, I don't understand. That's not very Christian, is it? What has that got to do with us? Why are you putting up the Ten Commandments? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we want to take the Ten Commandments. We'll stick them out in our yards. I'm, I'm, that's okay, I suppose. But, <laughs> but my point is, you'll see the Ten Commandments posted sometimes uh, as you're leaving a, a, a Christian church out on a little sign. You know, as you come in, you get five of them, and as you go out, you get the other five or something. <laughs> but, but So this is really interesting. But as Christians, then, we think the Ten Commandments are just very Christian. Why would you say they're Christian? I would think that maybe one of the, quick, the, you know, one of the quickest responses to that for most people would be to say, well, Christ talked about those things. So they're Christian. They're, they're important to me. Wow. So how can we embrace the Ten Commandments to which Moses never said Shema? And then when he did say the Shema, which caught everybody's attention, even to this day, we don't want that. What is the problem here? The problem is that it is incongruent, if you will, with what we have come to think in post-biblical times. If we hold to the Shema, and we say that Yahweh is our God and no one else, or Yahweh is one, only one, not multiples of anything, then I think we're putting our, our feet down on pretty solid ground. What do you think? I like that. I'm willing to take my stand there. And when Jesus comes along and he's the one promoting this and giving it the significance that he does, now I'm going to say, okay, well, I'll tell you what. It may not be very post-biblical Christian. It may not be, in your view, very Christian or very meaningful. But what about, I'm just going to stand right there. That's going to take my chances with Moses and Jesus. How about that? Rather than you, whoever you are. I have a, a ministry called 21st Century Reformation. I'm very keen about the Reformation and the great leaders of the Reformation. You know, Luther and all these guys, Zwingli and all these, these fellows. And I do regard them. I do have respect for them. And, uh, you know, uh, they, they founded some wonderful things and did some great things. And I, I have only the highest regard for all of those people. Okay. And others. Okay. The Wesleys, for goodness sakes. People uh, that I hold in very high esteem. But when it comes to this department, I think they all were still just boggled up here too much and they could never quite get out of this, this struggle. And it just happens that this department is the one that Jesus says, the most important department there is. So the world kind of fell into confusion back here, deciding that God is not one, but he's multiples. There are multiple somethings, we're not quite sure what to say, persons, beings, whatever, who are God. I think Moses might have run you off if you started talking about that. Furthermore, Jesus wasn't going to cut you much room either, was he? No. So, here we are. One of the two, I think, two most neglected passages in the Bible, and I said they're important to us. Particularly if you're, if you're believing something that is not exactly mainstream, and it's not, uh, you got a lot of other folks saying something different, then you want to know, okay, well, why am I believing this? You know that you do. I think we have a, a, a good conscience in our, in our assembly and people, and we've thought about these things, and we talk about them a lot. How about that? We talk with them, and hopefully we talk with them to our children so that they can grow up loving and knowing these same things. So the, these things are, are wonderful in our midst, great to us significant to us, beautiful to us. And I love that. But we need to know not just what we believe, but it's good to have sessions like this too to understand a little better why we believe it. It's just, to me, the word clarity just screams out in, the, in this thing. It's just, 
the Old Testament, I mean, how many times does God say, He is God, there's none other than Him, He's the Lord. You know, Jesus never said he, he was God. That's right. Jesus said He was the Son of God and the Son of Man, but yet we want to we want to look at clarity in the Old Testament when it comes to the New Testament. All of a sudden, no, no, it's not clear. Even though Jesus makes it clear, we want to make we want to create a mystery out of it. <laughs> yes, it's amazing to me. Yeah. It's just you know, it's just such a distinction between the two. It's so clear, but we want to create something and make it unclear, so to speak. I really like that thought, and your word clarity comes through clear. <laughs> uh, but that, I like that too. But one of the things that I think is so interesting about this picture that God gave to Moses about himself, and that God obviously gave to Jesus about himself, is the simplicity and clarity of it. You know, you say, well, God is really complicated. Well, that's, that's true in the sense. Oh, God is un understandable, unfathomable. That's true in a sense. But this is not hard. There's only one of him. That's not hard about him. Okay? So, and, and that's what he gave, the word he gave to Moses. That's the word he gave, obviously, to Jesus. And, yes, it's clear and it is easy. Children in Israel could understand this. It was not hard. So, your, your kids, the little guys, from the time they're old enough to kind of put two and two together, realize there's only one who is God. And that's it. So this, this works. So clarity, simplicity, I love it. Would you ever say that about the post-biblical developments that came later? <laughs> I, every once in a while I read some, some Christian, poor Christian, someone just a saint in the pew as it were, uh, you know, and they're writing and it all goes like this over and over again. I don't understand the Trinity, it may be, or I don't understand uh, there are people who have a view not of three as God, but of two as God, uh, the binity as it's sometimes referred to. So anyway, but they say, I don't understand it. And I know I'm, I'm worried because I'm supposed to get this, and I don't. I read here recently about a fellow, I read a fellow who had written in saying, I've been a Christian now for 20-something years, 27 years, whatever it was. And he said, I don't understand this. I still don't get it. Well, a child of five in Israel got it. Two of the Jewish folks were as committed because of the faith of Abraham, was committed the scriptures, was given the prophecies, was given the wonderful things, and came the Christ. You imagine this, uh, the, the, the Christians going out and saying, oh, there are two or three Yahwehs, because the Father's Yahweh, but Jesus is Yahweh too. Oh, my lands. I can just see, you know, little Jewish children computing that one. Doesn't work. Say, well, how does all that work? It's a mystery. <laughs> really? <laughs> okay. Well, well, you know, because you know, no one can understand it. Now I'm going to spend days trying to explain it to you. <laughs> and then, when at every point I wind up losing, eventually I'm going to come down to one, one place. It's a mystery. One of our, our Christian ministers, modern day uh, evangelical Christian fellows, and, and a very notable man. And not, don't, I'm not as casting aspersions unduly at any of these people. I'm taking issue, though, with their view in, in many of these cases. But uh, we have one, one very notable minister uh, from uh, uh, Memphis, actually, a huge church in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, very well known. I think he has died now, but. His words are still around, and you can see all these things. But anyway, his, his, he, I think he's the one that first coined the phrase, if you try to understand the Trinity, you will lose your mind. <laughs> but if you don't believe it, you will lose your soul. <laughs> okay, I'm back to Brother Wesson's word clarity here. <laughs> yeah. So, verses... 
What would you say over here? Complexity? Com confusion? The, uh, the Trinity only wins the day when uh, coercion is brought to bear. And our, our Christian friends today um, so many times don't realize why I feel so strongly about this Trinity thing. I'm telling you, you don't believe the Trinity? Oh, God, help us. Now let's get, oh, they, they don't know. They don't understand. You know. That's what they need to be asking for, God. <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, they don't realize why they feel the way they do about this subject. They don't understand why they're so, uh, it just stirs something immediately within them. Well, here's why. Because when the confusion came, and when the complexity came, and we're saying there are three who are God, each fully God, but there's only one God, because they found the Bible did say that, you know, there's only one God. So we're trying to figure, what we're really doing is colliding together two things that don't work. Three who are God with the idea of one God, put them together, and by the way, that's what creates the mystery. <laughs> We've just collided two things together that can't possibly work. And at the end of the day, the only thing we can do is say, it's a mystery. So uh, be kind to your friends. Be kind to folks. <clears throat> and sometimes uh, along the way, you know, realize that they came, <laughs> they came by all this honestly in a sense. They don't know. But, uh, but for, for you, you know, after you've been assailed by somebody and saying, you're, I don't think you're a Christian. You're not even whatever. You say all this stuff. Then just walk away saying, Shema Israel. <laughs> you know. The Lord, my God, is one Lord. I think that's kind of enough. What do you think? Would you teach your children that? Would you talk about it around the breakfast table sometimes? Would you talk about it when you're going to bed at night? Would you rejoice in that? Jesus did. Guess who else did with him? All his disciples. All the people there, the people who were writing the Bible, they grew up believing that. And Jesus, instead of saying, okay guys, it's time now for you to hear the real truth. Turns out, God is actually multiple lords. And there's more than one Yahweh. I'm Yahweh. My father's Yahweh. There's two or three of us Yahwehs around. This was the time for Jesus to say it, wasn't it? This was the time for him to tell his disciples, guys, now it's time for you all to grow up a little more. By the way, be on the guard for that one. Out here in the PB world, the post-biblical world, they weren't very advanced back there. <laughs> I, I, I hear that a lot. <laughs> they, the, 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 I, one of the things I hear about the New Testament is uh, them telling, saying about the New Testament is Jesus couldn't really explain to them about that there are three Yahwehs or three Lords because the Jews were so fixated on there only being one, they wouldn't have understood. So to these out here then, these folks out here in the post-biblical world, smart people by the way, don't miss them, very smart people. But I, but I tried to coin a phrase, I'm trying to do my best, but I've, I've just said this, and I think it's worthy to be coined, and that is, a really smart person with a bad idea is still just a person with a bad idea. We can't ever lose sight of that. Okay, but here you are, these people out here, they're, they're, they're going into this world of complexity, and I say confusion, and oh yeah, this is hard, it's this the most sublime of all the mysteries. I've heard that. Anyway, and, it, and all that. But we say all of that, and we say, well, they didn't quite get it back there, but this is the way it really was. What do you think? So I, I said in the beginning, and uh, we're going to, to stop here, but I said in the beginning, sometimes we know what we believe, and we, we understand it, and we realize it. We, it agrees with us, and it makes sense to us. And the truth always does if we come to grasp it. But sometimes we need to better understand why we believe it. Well, reason number one today is the Shema, Deuteronomy 6.4. Can you say that, those words? Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy, 
Deuteronomy 6 and verse 4. Yeah, very important. And the corollary to it in the New Testament is Mark 12. And where were we at? 29, I think. Yes. So Deuteronomy 6 and 4, Mark 12, 29. That should be, I'm not saying that you have to put it on a little box on your forehead. But it wouldn't hurt to get it in your mind and to raise your children understanding and glorifying this God. What do you think, everybody? All right.